Hello there and welcome. This video is for you who might be new to F1 Manager or F1 in general and we're basically going to be going over the basics of everything related to the F1 Manager game. So if you're looking for more in-depth guides I have those uh, on my channel. There's a playlist I'll link a race strategy and a development guide which is probably the two more important things to manage but basically this guide's whole purpose is to help you who are newer to F1 F1 managed games and generally how you can get off to a somewhat flying start here. So if you know how the game works, this probably is not for you. But uh, if there's anything in particular you are curious about, there are going to be chapters down below so you can jump to the parts that you might want to know more about. There's going to be a link to a playlist uh, in the description where you'll find most of my guides. But as said, this one is going to be pretty basic, but it's going to go through everything that you need to know about this game. So with that out of the way, let's just get right into it with the first thing that you're going to do, and that is choose a team. And it might be difficult to decide which team is best for you. And the easiest way to really make a decision here is to go through the teams and uh, how they're going to play. So the best team here is in the current game, of course, Red Bull. They're first in every metric. They have two good drivers and generally they should be fairly easy to learn the game with. The same can actually be said for Ferrari for uh, Aston and also to some degree here for Mercedes. All four of these teams are pretty good. Red Bull and Ferrari play almost the same. Aston is basically the uh, third easiest team. Then Mercedes has a little bit of a challenge, but they do have a decent uh, team setup. And honestly, it's not hard to be good with them. Middle of the three here, you're going to have Alpine. Alpine. And uh, I haven't played them personally, but they are a decent starting point. And at the back of the grid here, we're going to get into teams that can be a bit of a challenge, but still entertaining. Haas and Williams, for the most part, are good teams for this. Williams has a car that is uh, a bit quicker than the Haas car. But generally, if you want a bit more of a challenge, picking uh, one of these teams while learning the game is also decent. Uh, any of the four teams is good as well. Alpine is also a decent choice between the middle of being basically your top of midfield. You're expected to get both cars into the points. Uh, but other than that, you have the last three teams, Alpha Tauri, uh, Alfa Romeo and McLaren. All of them are kind of the same in terms of difficulty, but I'd rate uh, Alfa Romeo as the hardest. They only really have one thing going for them, which is spot as. Alfa Tauri is decent enough, uh, but I'd rate basically this is the hardest, second hardest Alfa Tauri, and then the eighth hardest McLaren because they have Norris. That's really just why. So we'll be, as I said, going through a little bit of everything here, and that is basically the team choice. Now, once you've chosen a team, in this case, we're just going to be messing around with uh, McLaren for this guide. You want to put in your uh, full name and surname. And honestly, if you want to, you can actually set up your guidance options here. Your first time manager, you'll get a full time guidance with uh, the guide in the game. Returning manager will go through the updates from the last game. And experience manager, which we're going to use for this guide, is, uh, well, no help. Other than that, you have car development and race Difficulties. So these go from easy standard to hard for both of them. And basically uh, on hard difficulties, the AI will be better at developing their cars, getting more research done, things like that. And for the race, basically easy. The AI will do minimal changes, minimal aggression. Uh, they'll be pretty soulless in all honesty, and that'll make the race a little bit easier. Standard, they'll have somewhat differing strategies, so they'll try and get a little bit of an edge over you, but honestly, it's still fairly easy. And hard is that the AI will be pushing the race strategy to kind of the limit. They'll be going for uh, basically the fast strategies that are available for the most part, and they'll actually be somewhat of a challenge. So feel free to pick these as you see fit, honestly. Uh, of course, feel, you can actually change these after the game has begun. So there's not actually a problem with picking standard, standard, easy, easy. You can actually change the difficulty between race weekends. So it's not actually a, uh, it's not a, a problem to pick something different. Now, once you're into the game, you're going to have this screen. You're going to be starting pretty close to race weekend. Bahrain is just in 11 days, meaning that the car has kind of been set up for you. But for now, we'll start moving through all of these uh, buttons down here and what they do. We'll be going over with everything in this UI does in uh, due time. But honestly, the first thing that you probably are going to want to be focusing on when you get into a game is going to be car development, which you'll find here under your cars tab. You can go into car parts development and work from there. Keep in mind that your money is going to be vital here. So 
don't throw it all away. But because of the fact that, well, when you start the game, the car parts that you have are actually pretty bad. And I can actually show you an example of what I mean by this. Every single time you start a game, every car in the game will be spawned with basically everything balanced. Every slider will be in the middle. And these sliders are actually how you affect a car part's performance. So if you were to increase the drag reduction here, we'd gain a lot of top speed. We'd lose some medium speed and high speed and some engine cooling. And uh, we'll be going through basically what all of these stats are, what they do. But just as a general term here, because everything is balanced, your car is actually pretty bad once you, it first gets handed to you, which is why it's important that you start developing parts fairly early. Now, with that out of the way, we're actually going to go through what all of these uh, stats here do. So top speed is actually pretty straightforward. Basically, what is the maximum speed of the car? Acceleration, how quickly it accelerates. This is a stat that you don't need to worry too much about because it's highly reliant on your engine, meaning that your engine will be basically 90% of your acceleration stat. Your DRS effectiveness is how uh, basically effective your, speed, your car is at gaining speed under DRS. It can be incredibly important for overtaking, so don't neglect this stat. Low speed, medium speed, and high speed cornering, uh, here simplified by Gs, is basically how good your car is at handling corners. The better it is at handling corners, the more speed you can carry through them, and in turn, the quicker your car will be. As a result of this, cornering is actually the most important stat when it comes to just pure pace. However, cornering alone is not uh, sufficient to get overtakes done. You are probably going to need a little bit of DRS effectiveness, as I said, it's going to be fairly important. Your top speed is going to matter a lot, so do keep that in mind. Cornering is the best uh, to focus on if you want a quick car, but uh, DRS effectiveness or top speed, one of them you are going to need to focus on a little bit as well. Now, dirty air tolerance uh, might sound a bit weird, but dirty air tolerance is basically just how much time do you lose behind another car. So in F1, when you drive behind another car in front, it's going to throw something called dirty air onto the car behind, which means that it's basically disturbed air that is a tad hotter, tad uh, harder to drive in. You don't get as much downforce. And as a result, if you have bad dirty air tolerance, your tires are going to heat up quicker behind other cars. You are going to struggle to overtake because you just can't keep up, uh, keep up with them. You're actually losing uh, lap time because of the fact that the dirty air is disturbing your car. So you're going slower. So this one is kind of uh, important, but honestly, as long as you get above 50 to 60%, for most cases, you'll be fine. So while it might seem a bit scary, it's nothing too serious. It's still something that you do want to keep high, preferably above 40%, 50 to 60% is definitely uh, really decent and acceptable. Brake cooling is a bit of an interesting one. So brake cooling basically affects the cooling of your brakes, but also your brakes, brake cooling has an effect on your tires. So the higher the brake cooling, the lower the uh, brakes effect on the tire heat. And also brake cooling has an effect on incidents. Basically, if your brakes are too hot, you increase the chance of lockups and other incidents that can take your driver out of the race. So it's fairly important to focus on as well. Now, engine cooling is, uh, well, it's cooling for your engine. But the more important part is that the engine cooling actually has a secondary effect. And if we go into the powertrain here, the powertrain has three components, the engine, the ERS, and the gearbox. Your engine cooling actually has a huge effect on how quickly uh, these wear. So high engine cooling, the lower wear on your parts. Now, why is this important? Now, because of the way that F1 works, you're only given three engines, you're only given two ERS components, and you're only given four gearboxes. And as you can see here, if we were to say use all these up by either having crashes or just very low engine cooling, we'd have to buy new components. In this case, a gearbox costs 1 million, a ERS costs 2.5 million, and an engine costs 5 million. And this also has an effect on the cost cap, which we'll get getting back to later. But if you have to buy a new component, not only is it a financial punishment, but you're also going to be moved back on the grid as a result. So because of that, we do want to get engine cooling high, preferably above 60%. And you can actually see also the final stat here, the total extra weight. And we'll be going into what that is. So with 24, 24, 23, uh, every, new, uh, every, every new piece of equipment has a durability modifier, which is basically the lifespan of a part. And as a general rule of thumb, I would just recommend turning this down to the minimum. Because as you can see, we gain a lot of stats on basically everything from this. We gain engine cooling, high speed cornering, 
medium speed cornering, low speed, acceleration, and top speed by simply getting rid of that extra weight. And in terms of the lifespan here, it goes down uh, for the chassis at least very, very little from basically 6 to 11 to 4 to 8. And here's the thing to keep in mind with these parts. Chassis, side pods, suspensions, underfloors, uh, front wing, rear wing, all of these can be destroyed in racing. As long as they uh, sustain minor damage, you can have to switch them out. So having a long lifespan, like say 14 races, might sound great. You're gonna save a lot of money. Uh, but if your driver crashes, not only are you losing uh, performance from the parts, but you still have to buy a new one way before the expiration date, if you will, because of it. So as a general rule of thumb, I just say put the lifespan to minimum. You are going to gain a lot of performance from it. And generally, the only part where you might see some issues with it, with having lifespan at the minimum here would be your front wing. Lifespan of one to two races. But honestly, your front wing is still fairly cheap. So I really wouldn't worry about this. If you really want to be on the safe side with your front wing, you can go ahead and just do something like this, add a little bit of weight. You still gain a decent chunk of performance, but your lifespan is now two to four races. And honestly, this is probably the only piece I worry about having lifespan higher than the minimum, as most other parts will be fine. Rear wings, front wings also take very little time to manufacture. So for those two parts, I wouldn't worry about having a very, very short lifespan. That is perfectly fine. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the the way that the parts work. And in particular, each part here has things they're good at, things they're bad at. And as such, you might, you might want to try and specialize your parts in the sense that your suspension, for instance, is really, really good at brake cooling. It is actually your main, uh, your main way of getting brake cooling. And as you can see here, if we take the base part that we're given and just focus brake cooling and minimum lifespan, we gain a ton of extra brake cooling, which is fairly important, but we also get a little bit of cornering. Now, the thing with the uh, with the the suspension is that it actually has an airflow front, and the way the airflow front works, or airflow uh, middle, for that matter, is that they have an effect on. In this case, since it's the front airflow, it has an effect on the low speed cornering. So, if we focus both of these, we're going to get a huge amount of low speed cornering as a result. Now, keep in mind, we do lose some brake cooling gains because of that. And basically what you might want to do then is focus your slider something like this. So as you can see, we're losing top speed, but we're gaining a whole lot of cornering. And in this case, the sacrifice of the top speed to the low speed cornering is definitely going to be worth it. And that is kind of the things that you have to focus on, because even if we were to say switch this around and go high speed cornering, as you can see, the gains aren't even close to what we get for the uh, low speed cornering. And that is because of this multiplier for one, but also because the suspension is really, really good at giving you low speed cornering ability. And we can actually go through every single part here right now, just immediately so that you know what they're good at. Your underfloor is actually a bit of a jack of all trades. So for this one, you can actually do kind of whatever you want. I still recommend you doing probably something more cornering focused. You can, of course, try and you know, sacrifice one of the stats for the others. That too is viable. But as you can see here, we are losing a lot of uh, top speed doing that. So potentially you could do something like this where you sacrifice the air tolerance, get a load of cornering. It is probably the best bat, particularly early game. But again, dirt air tolerance, as long as it doesn't go below 40% in your first season, you're usually fine. But for the second season and onwards, you do want to have it around 60% if you can. So the underfloor, well, that is probably what I would suggest. It is actually very, very malleable. It's good for every stat, so I wouldn't worry. Side pods are an interesting one too, because they have an airflow front and an airflow middle, but they don't actually have any direct impact with uh, cornering for low speeds, cornering medium speed, cornering high speed. You do that indirectly by moving these sliders around. And as you can see, we do get a uh, little bit of uh, High speed cornering if we do this, turn this down, get even more. And your side pods are going to be your main source of engine cooling. So engine cooling and brake cooling only have two sources each for the uh, engine cooling. It's going to be your side pods and your chassis. Your side pods are going to be far more effective at generating engine cooling. And for your brake cooling, it's going to be your suspension and your front wing. And same there, suspension is way more effective at generating it. As a result, because of that, we would probably want to do something like this again. We do lose a lot of top speed, but that's the thing. You can actually make a car that is cornering focused and still have a very, very competitive car. 
And as you can see, it, this alone gives us a ton of extra engine cooling, which of course is going to be helpful. So, well, this is why we recommend, honestly, it's up to you what you prefer. You can, of course, make a top speed beast by doing something like this. You sacrifice some of your cornering, you sacrifice some of your engine cooling, but you still get a decent amount of stats. And even if you really want to, you can switch these around so you get more low speed cornering. But honestly, I would recommend doing high speed because that is uh, what the Eflo middle here represents. And it is also what the side pods are best at. Side pods are best at cornering in addition to engine cooling. For your rear wing, this is going to be your only source of DRS effectiveness. And as such, we do want to focus on the DRS delta. Do you want to turn the lifespan down for the most part? And you can also go ahead and improve drag reduction here, which is going to be a huge source of top speed. So airflow sensitivity is kind of a weird one because again, it's hard to get. You can only get it from the wings and the underfloor. So what I would probably recommend is that we sacrifice every single cornering ability from the rear wing. And as you can see, it's still going to be an, be an upgrade in terms of cornering, but that's just due to the fact that we have turned the lifespan to a minimum. And if you ne really need to, you can go ahead and get some dirty air tolerance from this rear wing, but uh, it's going to, again, sacrifice a bit cornering. You're going to lose a bit of DRS effectiveness. You're going to get a lot of top speed. But generally, your rear wing can make up for a lot of the negatives of focusing on a cornering car, which is that you lose a lot of top speed. So the rear wing is very malleable, but basically focus it on DRS effectiveness, top speed, and then you can do whatever else you want with it. Front wing is uh, going to be your main source of, well, low speed cornering, as you might expect. It's also a secondary source of brake cooling, some airflow sensitivity, airflow front. So... We're kind of going to do the same thing here, where we go at full airflow, full low speed. And you can actually also go in medium speed if you want to. But what I really would recommend here is just turning these three sliders to the minimum. You're going to lose a lot of dirty air tolerance. You're going to lose a lot of brake cooling. But you can actually alleviate that by just pulling down the medium speed slider again. So while this is kind of, uh, you know, not great, you get a lot of low speed, low speed cornering ability, which is hard to come by. You can also, as I said, focus a little bit more like this if you really want to try and bring things down to zero. But the fact of the matter is you get so much brake cooling from uh, your suspension that you're usually fine with sacrificing brake cooling. But if I had to choose between sacrificing brake cooling or sacrificing 30 air tolerance, I'm pretty sure I would choose to sacrifice 30 air tolerance, keeping the brake cooling somewhat uh, at the same level as it was before. And you'll still have these gains across the board doing so. Now for the chassis, it is the other source of energy cooling. It also has drug reduction and airflow middle. So it basically only has three stats. And with that, you can kind of focus it a little bit like you see fit. You see the same here as you saw with the uh, front wing that you lose about 4.3% if you do this. But on the flip side, we uh, we gain about 10, 11%, I think it was from the uh, side pods. So basically we still have 7% gain across the table. And that's kind of what you need to measure it against. Now, the chassis is basically very malleable in the fact that it's incredibly good for high-speed cornering ability. And honestly, I would really recommend you do it just like this. The, uh, of course, you can sacrifice some of that cornering ability for better cooling if you really want to, but you're also going to end up sacrificing more top speed by doing so. You can also go for more of a drag reduction here, but honestly, the top speed that you get it's not worth it if you take into consideration the amount of cornering. So I really would recommend you do this for your chassis now the main thing here is that recognizing that you can uh, get really good parts by specializing them for one but also the fact that durability isn't as isn't really a big deal honestly you can do very well with the durability sliders at the minimum for everything maybe except the front wing and of course if your drivers have problems with crashing a lot you're gonna have maybe be a little bit behind on manufacturing but we'll go over that once we get to the race part so Car pass development, pretty straightforward. It's not really too much to say, that's that's to focus on. But you also have a couple of other things to take into consideration, and that is your CFD and wind tunnel hours. So the way that CFD and wind tunnel hours work is that for each unit invested, in this case for this one, 0 0.1 is a unit. For wind tunnel, one is a unit. So as you can see, we have 72 wind tunnel units. We have 54 CFD units. Every unit invested equals to a day of expertise gain. And expertise is basically the stat that you can see here, 45%. And every time you design a part, you get expertise. Every time you research, you get expertise for next year. And as I said, expertise is basically the hidden stat that determines how good a car part is. 
And the drag reduction on uh, our underfloor is independent from the drag reduction on any other parts. So drag reduction for your underfloor has no effect on drag reduction for your rear wing. Same for the cornering, same for every stat really. Every stat is unique to that piece. And the expertise tied to it is for that piece only. So keep that in mind. Now, as I said, <coughs> when you use CFD in wind tunnel time, you end up actually getting an extra day's worth of expertise use on the when you finish the project. So if we were to put in all of our wind tunnel and CFD time here, we'd end up with 72 plus 54 days worth of uh, expertise gain, basically just running it assigned. And in this case, that would be 126 days, unless my math is off. And when you take into consideration that the longest per period that you can actually run this project for would be 43 days, it would be the same that we basically ran this project three times in a row. So if you put in all the wind tunnel and CFD time into this part, what happens at the part's end, when it gets completed, is that we've basically now invested, um, if we run it on normal, basically now we've invested four designs worth of expertise gain into the parts. And expertise gain is reliant on where you place your sliders. So do keep that in mind. If there's something you want to be uh, focusing on, you place your sliders there. But honestly, as I said, every part has its strengths and weaknesses. So you usually be doing the maximized sliders anyways. In my case, as I said, I do prefer to focus on a cornering based underfloor, particularly early on. And with this, we get more expertise gains for the low, medium and high speed cornering than we would for airflow sensitivity and drag reduction. And as a result there, the next part we make will have more cornering ability. Now, the way the CFD and wind tunnel time work is, as I said, they give a small boost to the parts that we're making. But the main thing is that the expertise gain gets calculated after that part is finished. So that extra expertise gained from CFD and wind tunnel time doesn't actually apply to this part. So whenever you do a project with CFD and wind tunnel time, once the part is done, go ahead and make another one identical and then you'll see just how much of a gain you're actually getting from that CFD and wind tunnel investment. Now, the way that wind tunnel and CFD time works is that you get six periods in a year with CFD and wind tunnel, meaning that you can use this a total of six times. There's also a very common uh, misconception going around where you need CFD and wind tunnel hours to design a part. That is not true. You can design any part that you want with zero hours invested. W wind tunnel and CFD is basically just a boost to well, in the way that it works in this game, but in reality, wind tunnel and CFD time is just a boost to a part's expertise gains. And as a result, it's basically just a catch-up mechanic for teams rated lower, as you'll, depending on where you finish, the closer to 10th you get, the more CFD and wind tunnel time you actually end up getting. So keep that in mind. Now, once you actually get to this part where you're actually going to design, the way the engineers work is that they basically just cut down on the time but that also means that you'll have less expertise gain uh, in total. Now using engineers is actually pretty, perfectly fine, but because we cut down on time, uh, we're gonna be paying more to keep the project running all the time. So if you don't need the part desperately, I'd recommend just running one engineer, that's fine. If you can't uh, if you can do it financially, it's fine to use engineers, don't get me wrong. It's uh, nothing negative really. But keep in mind that uh, unless you can run all four of your design slots 24 seven, using engineers can be somewhat uh, uh, not maximizing your gains. Let's put it like that. It's not bad, it's very minimal, but it's something to keep in mind. Now your approach here is you have three options, normal, rushed, which you pay a premium for. As you see, the price increased by uh, basically one and a half times. And you also have intense, which increases it by three times. But as a, uh, as a bonus, you get one and a half times expertise gain, which might sound good, but if you consider the fact that you are paying three times as much for one and a half times as much gain, it's not really a good deal. But for lower rated teams, it can actually be really good because of the fact that the, because of how expertise gains work, the lower your expertise is, the quicker it grows. So using design on a lower rated team or intense design here can actually benefit you from that perspective. Rushed is just cutting down time. And if you put in the engineers too, as you can see, you can cut down time drastically. So if you need something quick, that is perfectly viable way of doing that. Now, once you've actually designed your part, you're gonna to need to manufacture it. And depending on your factory, which is a facility here, that I would really recommend you level up to, third, to level three as quickly as possible. Gives you four slots for manufacturing projects, speeds them up a little bit. 
Um, I really recommend you, as I said, level up that building. But basically, once you've made a part, you're going to need to manufacture it. Chassis takes uh, a lot of time, 10 days. Uh, your side pods take a lot of time. Your underfloor will be taking a lot of time. And same for the suspension. Only your front wing and rear wing are quick. So with that in mind, um, that is why it's not actually a problem having low durability on these ones. They front wings break a lot of anyways. But you really want four slots to develop these parts. And as I said, even though it could be very tempting with the lifespan, as long as you have four slots, you'll generally be fine with having the minimized lifespan for everything. I think that's all I wanted to go through for the car part development. It took way longer than I anticipated. But basically, it's just uh, it's one of the most important things for your progress and enjoyment of the game. So it's kind of important to, you know, get in there. However, don't feel forced to use what I've told you. Use my slide or something like that. You can experiment, have fun. That's the point of these games. Figure out if you want to make a speed demon that will overtake everyone on the straights or a cornering monster that will follow closely and then use DRS to overtake. It's all up to you what kind of car you want to make. Next up, we're going to talk a little bit about your research. In the middle of April, you get a uh, option on uh, technical directives, technical changes that will have an effect on your expertise. And in this case, we've been hit with a cornering change. We lose 30% of our current car expertise in low speed, 20% of the medium and 10% of the high speed. Now, this isn't just that we lose 10% of our high speed, but we lose 10% of our current high speed. So if our current high speed is 60%, we lose 10% of that. So basically these numbers can seem kind of meaningless on the screen, but they do tell you what you are losing. Now, also keep in mind, research has no effect on uh, your current car. It takes effect at the next year. So any research you do in 23 will affect your 24 car. Any research you do in 24 will affect your 25 car and so forth. But the main thing behind research and why it's important is because this expertise reduction has already happened for research. And the way expertise works is that the lower your expertise is, the quicker it goes up. So getting hit by a 30% drop in expertise for low speed, if we had 50%, 30% of that is 15%, we drop down to 35 next year. For research, that has already happened, meaning that the expertise gain while doing research is, is, is as if our expertise started at 35%, meaning that the gain is going to be a lot higher than if we do design. And any design we do anyways would still lose 30% next year. So once the collision changes are being... Uh, you know, announce research opens up. I'd recommend doing research for whatever is taking the hit. And once you've caught up to basically damage being done, you can then start focusing on the other aspects of the car. Now you have basically, again, ability of using sliders and depending on your expertise drops, well, what is, you know, taking hits, you can do something like this with 30, 20, 10. And in terms of engineers, again, you can use just one engineer, use six engineers. What basically designs that is just very simply, if you can keep all four slots running with six engineers, go ahead and do that. But if you can't, using one engineer is going to be your best conversion of money to expertise. Now, if you're curious about what I said in terms of what we're actually losing, you can actually have a look at that in your board tab, rules and regulations. And here you can see this little blue uh, uh, arrow here indicates that it's having some changes next season. And as you can see, it actually tells us exactly how much we're losing in terms of high speed, low speed, and medium speed, and how much we researched so far. So, so far, we've actually made up the high speed losses. We've almost made up the medium speed and almost the low speed, in this case, for the front wing. We've also gained 10% in airflow, 9% of brake cooling as an extra bonus. For the rear wing, as you can see, we have kind of the same thing here. Uh, we're still a little bit behind, not gotten full research done, but we gained a bunch of drag reduction DRS delta, which is very important for the rear wing. So honestly, it's not a big deal. The underfloor almost caught up as well. So basically here you can see what you're losing and how far you're from basically making up that loss. And that is basically the point of research. You just alleviate the losses that you're going to be having from regulation changes. And also, as I said, it's probably the most efficient conversion in terms of money into expertise. Next up, we talked about the cars. Let's talk about the second component to your car, which is, of course, the driver. So the way that driving stats work is actually pretty straightforward. Every driver has nine 
different stats. Uh, some of them are pace, consistency, racecraft, and these have an effect on your driver's lap times. In this case, your cornering, braking, and reactions will have an effect on your driver's pace, which basically translates into how quick they can do uh, run around the lap. Consistency, how good they do things consistently, safely, and reliably around the circuit. Accuracy, control smoothness. Uh, actually, smoothness is uh, probably the most important uh, important stat, but I'll be talking a little bit about that later. Racecraft, adaptability, overtaking, defending. All of these aren't really that uh, important, personally. But generally, your cornering, braking, and reactions are going to be big along with accuracy. These four stats will generally be the four stats that decide how quickly your driver is able to make his way around the circuit and thus have a huge effect on his lap times. Now, the reason why I'm saying Smoon is, is probably the most important stat is because in this game, a race strategy, which we'll be getting towards later, running as aggressive a strategy as you can is actually really, really powerful. It is the quickest strategy. <laughs> it's the quickest way to win races. So Smoonness is the ability to reduce tire wear while racing, meaning that uh, higher driver Smoonness, the more tire they have to use. And as the other driver's tires are great, you'll be quicker than them on virtue of having more tire left. So smoothness is actually incredibly important for that reason alone. Adaptability, basically just uh, if you're running dry tires on say a wet track. So honestly, it's not very important. I rate this one the lowest most likely. Overtaking and defending basically would indicate that they have an effect on your driver's overtaking and defending possibilities. But generally, I don't see much difference in overtaking and defending of a driver that is, uh, you know, lower rated, these down in the 60s, 50s, versus someone who's higher rated. They'll have a little bit of an easier time getting the overtakes done, but honestly, it's not something that is super important. The more important thing with overtaking is going to be your car. And of course, on some tracks like Monaco, they can be very important, but I wouldn't put most, most stock in these. I'm probably just focusing on these six stats up here. Control, basically prevents the racing incidents. Reduce the likelihood of driver causing local spins, crash, or running wide, which we'll talk a lot about a little bit more once we get into the race weekend itself. But as you can imagine, these six stats is what you should be focusing on for a driver, in my opinion. Now, up here, we actually have a development for drivers, and we can actually choose what we want to focus on. Balance, they'll work on all nine stats, but you can choose any of these, and they'll be working on four stats in particular. So, since we want to focus on, as I said, the four stats that kind of matter for us, we want to, in this case, try and improve uh, Norris's accuracy, braking, and cornering, which would give us basically better pace. But adaptability is also in there, so it is what it is. You will not basically be getting the maximum you want. There should be one or two stats you don't want. But in this case, we probably just put him on pace short runs and improve his cornering, braking, and accuracy. Because as we've seen here, control, smoothness are both really, really high already. Now, the other thing with drivers here is, of course, the contract, which honestly, um, in this game, don't worry about them. Not You can double sometimes the salary, and particularly with younger drivers like, say, Piastri here. You might try and double his salary to 2.8 million. He'll say no. And generally, this is just a general thing, but drivers in this game want rather high salaries, upwards towards 8, 10, 50, even 20 million. So you are going to have to give them higher salaries on uh, than they started with. And it can be really hard to negotiate a contract like that, so just keep that in mind. Now, other than that, let's jump into your staff, I think. Your staff are important for a couple of reasons. Your uh, technical chief and your head of aerodynamics have stats. You can see a cooling, DRS, delta, downfall, strike reduction management, and sensitivity of airflow. And all of these actually have an effect on your expertise, basically. Your staff will give bonus expertise that gets added to your car part, making the car part better, which means that all of these stats on your, in this case, head of aerodynamics, actually translates to better performance of your car. And the better your staff, the better that boost is going to be. You can also develop them as well. And since we basically would be focusing on basically uh, downforce here, we probably want to put them on grip and traction, or in this case, uh, ground effect, that could work too. But generally, again, just you can put them on what you see fit. It's not a big deal. And you have the same here for your technical chief, who actually has uh, just a flat out boost to the part itself. Suspension, underfloor, cycles, rear wing, front wing, and chassis. The higher the stat, the higher the boost. But basically, it goes up to, I think, is 5%, unless I'm mistaken. 
it's either five percent or yeah i think it was five percent but it's it's it might sound sound very minor but once you get closer to the expertise cap basically the higher your expertise the lower the gains the extra gain here from your staff is actually going to be quite important so do keep that in mind but honestly as a new team, I would focus on the car until I start hitting 70 to 80% expertise on the parts. And after that, I'd probably start working on basically poaching new staff members. Your race engineers have three stats there, communication, ability to communicate clearly and effectively, faster affinity growth between the race engineer and the paired driver. So let's talk a little bit about this. Race engineers have an affinity with their drivers and depending on their affinity, the confidence system, which again is something we'll get back to later, it's going to have higher or lower starting points. And basically, the better the confidence, the more stat boost they'll be getting. But we'll be getting back to that later. So communication basically just grows affinity quicker up to the cap, which, of course, is good enough. It's nice to have, but not something super critical. Feedback, a higher rating, means quicker feedback and improve the car setup during practice. So during practice, you want to set the car for the driver to get them a better starting point for confidence. Again, get back to that during practice, but it's kind of good to have. And composure, ability to focus in high stress environment. Higher rating means less driver confidence loss from a negative event, more confidence gain from positive events. So this is actually probably the most uh, most important stat that a race engineer can have because confidence is pretty volatile, which sounds silly, but it is actually pretty volatile in the game. So having high composure in your race uh, engineer can be really, really good. For your sporting director, He's going to be very important because he's basically your pit boss, the man in charge of your pit crew. And he has four stats. Training, how efficiently the uh, pit crew develop uh, skills. Aptitude, basically the cap on how uh, skilled your pit crew can go. Basically, the aptitude sets the skill ceiling of the pit crew skill. Pit crew skill is still rated from 0 to 100. But in this case, because this guy's aptitude is only 86, the highest level that they can reach out of 100 is 86. So as his aptitude grows, so will the potential skill ceiling of the pick crew. Leadership, ability to manage a team through high pressure situation. Basically, whenever you have a pitch stop mistake, this skill helps minimize the time loss from that mistake. Processes, ability to develop and refine efficient workflows, high the rating, less fatigue that the pick crew gains from race weekend and training sessions. So basically, your pit crew has fatigue, and we'll be going actually into pit crew right now. This skill helps uh, kind of diminish the amount of fatigue your pit crew gets. Next up, we're going to take a quick look at the pit crew. So as you see here, under your staff, you have a pit crew, pit crew tab, and they'll tell you their estimated performance, their current uh, condition, and your sporting director. Now, if you go into development here, you can actually set up a schedule for your pit crew. You can see their stats. In this case, as I said, out of 100, 86 is the aptitude count, which is why they can only go up to, well, 86. And they have attributes, jacks, use tires on and off, wheel gun, and car release. These five stats are basically how likely your team is to make an error. So as these five stats go up, the less likely your team will be making a mistake, as you see down here. And your car building is basically just how quickly your team can put together a car. In this case, we want to put together a car in practice to change the setup. This would be the stat. I honestly don't think it's valuable, so I wouldn't focus on it. And the last stat here is the estimated pit stop time of 2.6 seconds. So how do we improve these stats? It's actually rather simple. We go into the active training. You'll have to set this up at the start of every month, but you can change it anytime you see fit. And the game even has some presets here. You can change to pits of errors, pits of time, car building, fatigue reduction, and generally whatever you want. You can also go ahead and set up a custom training schedule. And that's probably what I rec would recommend you doing at the start of every month because of the way that the, the pit stop crew training works. Um, when the game released, it was uh, probably badly balanced. Let's put it like that. So you could basically max your pit crew within a season and they would stay max forever. So they nerfed that pretty heavily. Now your pit crew will be basically a struggle to keep them performing as they have been. And as a result, the base setups here that the game gives you will sometimes put you into weary territory. So your fatigue of your pit crew here is scaled into four different regions. You have well rested. You have tired, which goes up to 50%, and from 50 to 75%, you have weary. 
each of these blocks increased the chance of making a mistake. Basically going from well rested to tired increases by about two and a half percent. Going from tired to weary increases by 10 to 15 percent. And going beyond that to uh, exhausted will increase your risk of making an error by 30 to 40 percent, meaning that you have about a 50 percent chance of making a mistake. So managing the fatigue of your pit crew is going to be the most important thing you do in terms of avoiding pit crew errors. Now up here we have a total and cumulative. Basically the way that the cumulative tab works is that each time you make a change here, you can actually see how your pit crew would perform on, uh, well, your pit crew status, if you will, on the set day. So as you can see here, the fatigue stat here, as I hover over these days, it changes. So you can see that the, the resting, everything changes as the pit crew gets uh, stuff done. And generally here, I would recommend that you try to, on the Thursday before a race weekend, to be down to less than 20% fatigue, and then you'll usually be fine. But as you can see here, as we go on with gym trainings, they become more and more fatigued. But we also see that the estimated pit stop times are actually going down, but it's very, very minor gain. So do keep that in mind. It is quite hard right now in the game to get down the estimated pit stop times. So honestly, I probably wouldn't recommend focusing on the estimated pit stop time here. It goes down very, very little. You can have to put in a lot of effort. I would probably recommend instead that, at least for the start of the game, for the couple of months, you just focus on pit stop errors. Of course, having quick pit stops is gonna benefit you a lot, but if you have to kind of sacrifice your chance of making an error, because it doesn't matter if your pit stops are 2.3 seconds, basically is what you'll maybe get it down to. Uh, on average, if you make a pit stop error every fifth stop, particularly also with the aggressive strategy that we're gonna be going over in the race uh, strategy guide. So as you can see, if we change this over to just this, not only do we get less fatigue, from working these days, goes up by just one percentage point. But we also gain a lot more stats, I would argue, because we lower the chance of mistake by 1%. We do get a lot more estimated pit stop time, don't get me wrong. But honestly, what I, I would do this first, try and get these uh, stats more towards the maximum, then start working on pit stop time once we've kind of maximized the, uh, well, not maximized, minimized the chance of making a mistake. And that is honestly how I would do it. I do have a guide that's kind of, that's really outdated on the pit stops, so don't follow that. <laughs> I think I think I've updated that one. That the top comment does mention that, but just keep that in mind. The next thing of importance here is going to be your facilities. So as I mentioned earlier, you do want to get your factory up to level three. But what other buildings do you want to upgrade? That's what we're kind of going to be going through. So keep in mind that all of these buildings have a monthly upkeep. And for your car development facilities, every building's upkeep does go into your cost caps. So in this case, out of our full cost cap here for the factory, we pay about five point something million every year for having the factory running. But as I said, this increase is very, very minimal. It's definitely worth it to upgrade the factory. Same can be said for the design center, but that too does give you a bit more of a monthly upkeep. But as you can see, it does improve your car's um, characteristics and this is the if you make a part basically you need to design a part to get these bonuses so if you do an upgrade it will not affect anything that you've already manufactured or designed for that matter you're gonna have to make a new design and manufacture that new design to get these buffs but the design center does have some decent buffs here for your parts so it's somewhat worth upgrading but honestly your suspension sim and your car part test center if you are going to be upgrading anything here after you've upgraded the factory in the car development uh, tab you want to do these first. And the reason for that is very, very simple. They have literally no upkeep. As you can see, if we upgrade this to level three, the upgrade increases by just 10,000, but we'd get a decent amount of downfalls for the underfloor rear wing and front wing. Remember, this is cornering ability and it's kind of uh, important. We also get cooling for the brakes and the engine. That is good. And we also get drag reduction and the RS delta for the rear wing. So kind of the same here with suspension, the same. Again, very, very cheap to upkeep. And it gives you some good bonuses to, in this case, just the suspension. So I'd recommend doing the car part test center first, then the suspension, and then maybe the design center. Because as I said, the increases here in upkeep is gonna be pretty drastic once you hit level five. But honestly, as long as you don't go mad, the cost cap shouldn't be an issue. Now you might 
see that I haven't actually mentioned the wind tunnel or the CFD sim. And the reason for this is while the effects gained per unit of testing might sound really, really good, uh, they aren't, let's be honest. So as an example, the car park test center currently gives us 40 units of, uh, or 40 newtons for the current level. The CFD sim, if we were to use uh, per unit of testing, again, if we use 100 units of testing, we currently have 150, no, we have 126. If we use the same amount of testing, we get basically around the same as the car park test center at level two gives us. But the thing here is that the upkeep is way higher for one. It does not really affect expertise gain, which is the big important thing. That's actually the main benefit of CFD and internal time. And as a result, the bonuses here are very, very small, and generally they're just not worth it. You can only use your wind tunnel, uh, sorry, you only have six periods of wind tunnel and CFD time a year. So while these effects gained per unit of testing might sound and look really, really enticing, the upkeep makes them just not worth it. There's just no point in upgrading CFD or wind tunnel time, and I really recommend you just leave these at whatever level you start with. In our case, we start with level, level two, Unfortunately, we can't downgrade it, so we're just going to have to live with it. But yeah, I definitely not recommend upgrading either of these at all. Don't do it. Leave these as they are. Your star facilities, your team hub, and your race sim. I recommend upgrading these uh, to level 5 as quickly as you can as well. Your race sim gives your drivers weekly development, which means that they will level up or get more progress for their skills. Team hub does the same for your staff. Also gives you a little bit of morale. But generally, the weekly development here, basically passive development, is big for both the team hub and the race sim, and I would recommend you upgrading them. Your scouting department basically just designs your scout capabilities, so capacities. So honestly, you're not going to be scouting too many drivers in a year. So honestly, I just recommend leave it as is, unless you really want to upgrade it and scout everyone. Now, the operation facilities are kind of an interesting kettle of fish. So the boardroom here, race confidence gain, team attractiveness, uh, it can be very, very good if you are in a bit of a struggle. Basically, the race confidence gain is for the board, uh, which means that if you do well, you'll get more confidence from the board, meaning that they will not be as angry with you. If you are in a struggling period, you can upgrade this to try and get a little bit of extra help. But generally, I wouldn't bother with it. That can actually be set for a lot of these uh, buildings, the hospitality, the memorabilia, the tour center. Well, not really. The tour center has been changed. It used to before have a monthly upkeep that made it kind of not worth it. But as you can see right now, it's weekly income for no upkeep. And generally, I rec would recommend upgrading this as you can. Memorabilia, hospitality, and boardroom, not really that important. It does say that it gives your team attractiveness. That's basically just to staff and other drivers. But generally, performing well will have way more of an effect than any of these buildings could have. Now, the other two buildings I have talked about is the helipad. And this one is very important because it gives you sponsored targets payout plus 2%. At level 5, it'll give you 5% extra payout, which honestly makes it pay for itself really quickly, as it, again, has next to no upkeep. And if you can reach the sponsored targets, getting an extra 5% on a 3 million payout is going to basically pay for itself really, really quickly. Now, the weather center is also one of those interesting buildings because it has forecast accuracy. This tells you how accurate the forecasts are during the race. And honestly, you can upgrade this one, but running it at 60%, I haven't had any big problems. Um, so this one is going to be personal taste. You, you can upgrade it, but you don't need to. It also has a fairly decent monthly upkeep. But again, nothing too major. So I would just leave that as it is in terms of the facilities. So if you have any question there, feel free to ask them. Next up, let's take a look at the board and your finances. So your board has a few things you can have a look at here, mainly your board confidence, which is a uh, combination of your race performance, your objectives and your financial situation. So currency is objective is seventh or above. As long as you are seventh or above on the sheets, the board will be happy. And the long-term objective, as long as you beat this within the 26th season, you'll usually be fine. Now, the main thing that I want to talk to you about board confidence is that the main th reason why people get fired in this game isn't necessarily bad results. It's because they go into death. The board hates being in death more than basically you burning down the entire factory. 
So honestly, just do your best to stay out of death, even if it's going to hurt you uh, in terms of results. I would recommend don't use any money that you don't have. And that is basically the most important thing in keeping your board confidence uh, higher. But we'll go and have a look at that again probably a little bit later. You can also have a look at the budget, which is, uh, again, doesn't really tell you much. The team rating, and again, this is basically, as I said, which is going to have a bigger effect on who you can hire. As you see, the team rating currently is three and a half star, a little bit more. Uh, we can see the rating in terms of a number here. Constructors results for the last uh, four years, drivers heritage, and just general heritage here. Championships won, seasons entered, and things like that. So basically, again, the team rating has a huge effect on who you can hire and who you can kind of cajole into joining your team. You can also have a look at your rating here. It tells you your own rating. Basically, this only matters if you're planning to switch teams at the end of the season, which you can, and it gives you your stats, basically. You can also have a look at recent history, season one and projects, in progress here, but it'll tell you your performance. So basically a good little history. Now, the rules regulation tab is kind of interesting. Currently, it doesn't actually show anything. And the reason for that is because we haven't actually had any rules or regulation changes happen yet. So we'll have a look at that a little bit later, but it tells us the 24 changes for the technical, financial and sporting regulations. So again, we'll have a look at that a little bit later once we actually have any of those happen. I might use a different save for that just to showcase it. But generally, if uh, a regulation change happened, which they do in April here, as you see, first technical regulation change, then, if I'm not mistaken, there should be another one in... When was it? I thought it was July? Is it August? Yes, there we go. New regulation mode here in September. But I think there's one... There should be three regulation modes in a season, so I missed one somewhere. Ah, July. There was one there, as expected. So, you'll have those three regulation votes, and... Once they've been voted through, you can actually check them at any time through rules regulations. And it'll show you your current research versus the changes for 24. But as I said, once we actually get into the research, we'll be going over that. Uh, financially, this is also kind of an important tab. And the sponsorships here, it does say manage your team sponsorships. But generally, it just shows you what your current sponsorships is. And I'll be going over these later on. But generally, sponsorships are bad. That's the best way I can describe it. There are a couple of good sponsorships like the merchandising, which will give you an extra income. But in general, uh, sponsorships are just ways to slow down your progress and also sabotage your team. So keep in mind that sponsorships here are a very much a double edged sword and the vast majority of them just aren't worth it. As an example, this race simulated event. Race simulated weekly drive dollar boost is reduced for the week of each event. They, we get paid 2.3 million for this over the course of the season, 2.3 million total. And for 15 out of 52 weeks, the race sims expertise gain will be reduced. So honestly, is it worth it? Not really. Same here for the race hospitality. There's 22 races. And as you can see, 18 of those, we're going to have decreased pit crew performance. And the only thing we get paid from that is half a million. We can get more, we can get more than that from sponsor targets payout than we get from the sponsorship. So again, this is just a nerf to the team, more or less. And that is just how sponsorships works, works currently. So keep that in mind. At the end of the season, you'll be allowed to uh, kind of renegotiate some of these. Some of, some of them you're locked into, but some of them you can renegotiate. And one of the most egregious examples of a bad sponsorship is that this one of them that lowers control, meaning that you, it makes your driver way, way more likely to crash. But we'll go over that too at the end of a season and I'll show you how you can renegotiate them. So that is basically this, but we do need to talk about the cost cap. So the cost cap here has two tabs, your current spent and your projected. So current spent is pretty straightforward. It is what you've so spent so far this season and projected is what you expected to have left come December, uh, well, the end of December this year. And this is the important want to keep a hold of because it takes your it takes into consideration your upkeeps and as such it's uh, the most reliable number so use this if you want to know how much cost cap you have left and as you can see here staff salaries engineering team scouting team pit crew uh, facilities this is upkeep and this is the amount of money the team has spent already on car parts now keep in mind that staff salaries here 
is kind of an uh, kind of an interesting one because uh, some of your staff are actually exempt from exempt from uh, being paid. So if we take this in consideration, Joseph here, William Joseph, Tom Stallard, a million plus a million point three. 2.3 million plus 800,000, 3.1. Well, around there. Gives us basically the financials of the staff salaries. So, in reality, your technical chief and your aerodynamics are both exempt from the cost cap. So, you can actually pay these guys as much as you need to to get them to sign, and it will have no effect on your current cost cap. So, these three have an effect, these two do not. And neither does your driver's salaries. Your driver's salaries has no effect on your cost cap either. And there are some buildings that doesn't actually have an effect. In this case, the only the only building here that has an effect on the cost cap is the weather center, your boardroom, hospitality, helipad, memorabilia, and tour center. Neither of these have an effect on your cost cap. So take that into consideration. Not everything goes in the cost cap, but it is important to know what it does as it will make your life a little bit easier. But yeah. Generally, making parts is generally as long as you don't rush too many parts, as long as you don't use intense design, and as long as you don't have uh, too many instances where you need to say emergency manufacture, which is a way something you can do, you can rush an, an approach, which costs some time, or you can emergency manufacture get it immediately. But as you can see, it's going to cost you a million versus three hundred thousand. So, as long as you stay ahead of your parts you'll be fine. Generally, I recommend having four of each part, basically one for each driver, two, and then one reserve for each driver, another two. And that usually keep you ahead of any damage for the most part. But yeah, that was it for financials and cost cap. The next thing we're going to cover is the race weekend itself, which is split into three distinct parts, practice, qualifying and the race itself. Keep in mind that there are a couple of variations of this where you have uh, spring weekends, which basically just give you P1. Then you have quality instead of P2. Basically, you take these three, move them to this lot right here. Then you have basically P2 instead of P3. And then you have the race. So you only have, uh, well, you have a sprint race and then you have the race. So that changes things a little bit. But generally, the weekends are going to go the same way, no matter how you play them, if it's spring weekend or not, they kind of act the same uh, with a slight variation. So once you get into sprint weekend, you get an overview over the track. You can check your sponsor goals. You can check your reports and generally get a good idea of what's happening. The first thing that you're going to do is practice and practice is, uh, well, you can do it manually by manage practice one or you can simulate the session. But generally what you want to do is uh, potentially do a little bit of switching of car parts before practice. Generally, you want to use whatever parts are the lowest in terms of durability for practice. This is very important as your parts will start to lose performance when it comes to the engines, the gearbox and the ERS. For the engines, they start to lose performance massively once they hit about 50%. So after an engine hits 50% durability, you want to only use it in practice. You can actually use a part in uh, practice until it reaches zero durability and you should be doing so. For your ERS and your gearbox, they both start uh, losing performance around 40% durability. So basically, after they reach that point, just use them in practice, switch to a better, higher engine before the race itself. But practice, there is one thing that you want to do here, and that is get your car set up correctly. You are going to be trying to maximize track acclimatization, which basically increases by just having your drivers run the track. Nothing special there. Car part knowledge works in the same way. Every time you design a new pass that the drivers haven't used before, they're going to have to drive around a track to get used to it, build up knowledge. And the setup is the one thing that you have some uh, somewhat a chance of influencing. And what I mean by this is actually really, really simple. The setup is a little bit of a mini game. You can, of course, do it manually, but we're going to do it just, uh, in a sim way for this. But Feel free to practice manually, it's not a bad idea. You can also sim it, but generally you want to figure out what is a good setup for your car. And it is actually basically a driver individual. What I mean by this is that there is a setup window that is usable for most drivers on basically every track, but um, 
Sorry, I'm getting distracted trying to do two things at once. Uh, let me just go over that again. The way that setups work is that for every track, there is a certain setup that is a good starting point. That is what I've shown you here for Bahrain. There is a F1 setup calculator I'll show it to you too. But every driver has specific setups that work best for them. These don't actually change from season to season. So if you figure out a perfect 100% setup, you can note it down, use the next season, and you'll figure that out. But the point of practice is to lower these bars into the perfect window. And if you don't know the setup, you can, of course, do it uh, blind. That works out very well. You can either sim or manage practice. You can simulate all the way to qualify. But for the purpose of this, we're just going to sim through the first practice session. And if we have a look now at the results, you can see that both drivers have gained some track acclimatization. Car parts knowledge, 17% for both. This is actually shared, so don't worry about that. And as you can see, we hit a fairly high setup satisfaction already for both drivers for having them run approximately the same setup. And as you can see, we figured out that the brake stability, traction, Piastri really likes them like this. And the idea is to use the next few, next couple of practice sessions to figure out the windows for the two things that we don't know. So with that in mind, we'll just slightly change the stats around. Of course, if your window is wider, you're probably going to have a little bit of a harder time figuring it out perfectly. But generally, you should be able to get a fairly high setup. But of course, on particularly sprint weekends, when you only have one practice session, you might want to do it manually for that reason alone. And as you see, if Pope Piastri were just lacking one point, we've hit 100% with Norris, so we don't really have any benefits from, uh, from well, changing it. And boom, we've hit 100% setup, satis setup satisfaction for both, decent track elimination, and Carbaz knowledge. It's going to take you a couple of race weekends to get that up, so don't worry about it. And to get 100% track acclimatization, you are probably going to need to... Uh, do the practices manually anyways. Now, as you see here, they both have the exact same percentage of driver preparation, but these bars, which represents confidence, Norris is higher confidence than Piastri. And this is what I mentioned earlier with engineers. The engineer affinity, basically how well your driver and engineer work together, has an effect on the confidence bars. If they have good affinity, like Norris, basically the lowers uh, get moved more to the left, you have more highs. And if they have bad affinity, like Piastri here, who's new to the team, the uh, the bands will go higher, and basically you'll need to push confidence high to get beneficial results. So generally, though, the only way to really improve that is just with time. So there's no magic way of fixing that. Generally, though, after you've done practice, you might want to, as I said, switch to the parts that have better percentages. But honestly, for the first five, six races of the year, until this engine has 50%, until these ERSs and gearboxes is 40%, you're not really gonna need to switch parts. Um, so don't worry about that. You can keep that as it is. But when it comes to qualifying, we have a couple of things to keep in mind. But before that, I want to just mention this. As you can see, we've sent back, in this case, six sets of tires. And what this tells us is that for the practice session that we simmed, Piastri, Whenever you send a practice session, they will usually use two sets of tires. In this case, we actually have three mediums available, which uh, usually does not happen. <laughs> but they do use two sets of tires at each practice session. You can't control which tires they use. So if you want to control the tires, you are going to have to do them manually. But generally, it's not a big deal. Now, for Quali, you are met with this screen where we can actually set up a plan. But honestly, unless you're planning to do something when while well, you're new, it's best to just leave it as it is. And we'll be focusing on just doing quality in the easiest way possible. And to do that, we're just going to jump directly into qualifying. Once we get in, we just want to send out a driver immediately. Give a little bit of a gap for the second driver and then send them out. And the reason why we're sending them out immediately is because the track is usually pretty clear right after qualifying begins. And they're currently on automatic mode, which means that the drivers themselves will deal with everything. And the main thing that you're actually in charge of during qualifying, unless you do want to use it manually, is actually figuring out good gaps to send your drivers out in. And what do I mean by that? Every time your drivers have to overtake a car in front, basically there's going to be slower cars uh, on an outlaw. You can see Norris here stepping away from Russell and Albin. Every time you do that, there's a chance that you're going to lose a little bit of time. If, say, Norris were to catch up to a different driver in the corner, they can't really get out of the way. And the main goal that you're going to have 
is to find good windows to send your drivers out into. After they've done one run, I usually recommend just sending them out again on that same tire, unless they're safely through to the next uh, session. And as you see, our drivers are not safely through. Um, Piastri is kind of in trouble. So what we're going to be trying to look for here is, as I said, those gaps. And you can actually use this to see which cars are on an in-lap, which cars are on fast laps. In this case, we have De Ries and Verstappen, which means that both of these guys are going to be crossing the finish line, then slow down and do a in-lap, and then uh, they'll be pitting. So De Vries hit two on a fast lap, Bottas is on a out-lap, which means that this basically is warm-up lap. Once he comes around this corner, he's gonna go for a full sprint, uh, full speed lap, try and set a good time. But that is basically just how it works. Whenever the cars leave the pits, they'll have an out-lap, which is basically just get tires, everything prepped for a fast lap. They'll do the fast lap, then they'll do an in-lap. So every qualifying run is as such three laps as i said we want to find a good window and currently with just two cars on fast laps bottas on a potential fast lap in a second what we're going to do here is actually just wait for bottas to get out of the way and what do i mean by this bottas is about to start a fast lap russell and albin here should both pit and they are and with that we now have a decent gap where we can actually send out our cars provided you know not everyone <laughs> does the same thing that we did but it did happen. So even if you try and plan things correctly, you might get a little bit unlucky. Now, Piastri has a decent window here, but as you see, Perez, Alonso, Sargent, a lot of these cars now just opted to jump out. But Piastri has, still has a decent amount of free air here. Norris has to follow some other cars, so not the best gap. But that is generally the way that you'll be doing qualifying. You'll be looking for the best gaps that you can and send your cars out respectively. And as you can see, Piastri did improve his time. Norris, on the other hand, did not, unfortunately. And as you do more and more laps here during qualifying, you'll see that the driver confidence goes up. Um, driver confidence is very important because, as you can see, it gives uh, some extra pace stats, accuracy, braking, cornering boost. And these are actually really important for your lap times. It improves them by a lot. Overtaking and defending, not as much important. But as you can see, this chance of an incident, incident too is very, very important. So by sending the cars out for more than one lap, you can actually build confidence up to the peak level and thus have them perform better than you would usually expect. So with that in mind, we're just gonna go ahead and speed things along here. Norris and Piastri are currently on their in-laps. And for Piastri, I know for sure that he is not gonna be able to uh, qualify into Q3 uh, at best, he'll be probably around 15th because of the limitations of the car and the limitations of the uh, of the setup, if you will. As a result, driver skills, he has been butchered in this game. It's just how it is. Uh, but because of his limitations from the car and as a driver, if he gets into Q2, that's going to be great. But most likely, he's not going to be able to. So I don't want to use a fresh set of tires here. But if you want to, you definitely can. But do keep in mind that you can actually check if you want to, say, sacrifice a couple of positions in order to make sure that you have extra, in this case, soft tires. Because as you can see here, we can actually calculate a little bit in terms of the compound performances. So a soft tire average lap is 133.4, medium tire 133.2, and the degradation difference between the two is 400. There's an 8 tenth difference in time. There's a 400 difference in degradation. If we do the math there, 8 tenths split on 400s, it'll take 20 laps for the softs and the mediums to come, become comparable, basically equal in terms of lap time. So the soft tires around this place are really, really powerful. And that is why in this case, even though we have a fresh tire available for Piastri, I'm not willing to sacrifice that fresh tire because it'll be way, worth may, way more than in just a couple of positions in race trim. And that is also one of the things that you should potentially have a look at during quality. But there's very, very few tracks where the soft tires uh, actually matter that much. It's generally here and I think two other places. So again, not a big deal. You can uh, you can safely ignore what I just said. It's going to be a little bit more important though for setting up your race strategy, which we will be going over after we're done with the qualifying here. Now, towards the end of the session here, everyone will try to do one final flying lap. You can kind of see them line up right now. And if we have a look at the in-laps and out-laps, um, currently Paris, Verstappen, well, they aren't actually out on track, that's why we don't see them. But let's see, Hulkenberg, where is he? 
He's on an outlap, outlap, outlap. Most cars here should be on outlaps. And what we want to do now is probably go out in this gap because everyone is going to go out. This is a gap. Ocon is on an outlap. Hulk is on an outlap. And we want to make sure that when they are done with their fast lap, they haven't caught up to us. So we're going to take this opportunity to send Piastri out. And as you can see, some other cars actually jumped out in front of us. We're going to do Norris as well. But if you end up in a bad window, let's say that for Piastri, this isn't actually a bad window. But if you do end up in a bad window, there is actually a way you can uh, somewhat control that. And I'll go ahead and show you. Let's say that you send out your car like Leclerc and Hamilton here, where they are a little bit too close to each other for comfort, you can actually go ahead and take manual control. And when you do, keep in mind that it, you want to push fuel, for one, but you also want to put up the push up the aggression, because when you take manual control, uh, your driver will, as you probably see here, immediately speed up quite a bit. And that is a little bit of a problem, because of, well, your driver is speeding up. You'll overtake other cars, and that'll also mean that you get to a line quicker. So you need to make sure that you push push enough that you have heat in your tires. But generally, the automatic mode works perfectly well. I'd only use manual mode in the events like this, where you might have gotten stuck behind a car you really, really don't want to be behind. But generally, you'd be uh, you'd be perfectly fine not doing what I have done here. And as you can see, we're not even improving on that time. So Piastri is unfortunately out which is kind of what we expected we might have been able to fight him into uh, q2 if we really wanted to but in general you're not gonna have that uh, sort of benefit but yeah basically we just do all sessions like that that is the best way to deal with quality and then we'll go into the race itself once you finish qualifying you're gonna get thrown into a race screen here race prep basically and there's a couple of things to keep in mind here when you get into race day. It's going to have an effect on your strategy. You want to have a look at basically the compound performance that I showed a little bit earlier. Here you can see how they're expected to perform against each other. And again, to find out how long a tire holds advantage against a different one, we just take the difference here, uh, 400s, split on the difference up here, which is 8 tenths. Uh, 8 tenths, split on 400s, 20, 20 laps advantage of softs to the mediums. And you can use that as a big of, bit of a pointer on how to set up your strategy. But generally here, the hards aren't going to be good. Because, well, we'll be getting into that on the strategy points. So all ties are good, but on some tracks, one is going to basically stand out as best. And this is something you might be want to keep an eye out on to make your strategies a little bit easier. You don't really need to do these calculations, though, as the race strategy planner will basically do them for you. But it's nice to, again, just know that this information is here. You can also have a look at what you can expect in terms of pit, time, pit times. Well, pit lane time loss, in this case, 23 seconds. And if you pit on a safety car, VSC, 19 seconds. So you save four seconds if you pit under one of those. So it gives you a good idea of what you can expect. Now, it also does have the expected strategies here for AI. So soft, soft, medium, medium, soft, 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 medium, soft, which is probably going to be the quickest strategy around this place because of the fact that softs are strong and i want to just show you an example of that because we can, you can do a medium to hard one stopper you might be worried that the uh, red here and the yellow is uh is worrisome but the the way the game works currently is that what you should be doing is running the most aggressive strategies that you can and as long as the degradation once you get into the race you'll get a uh basically a line that describes your tire's current degradation. As long as that white line doesn't dip below the expected, you're perfectly fine running as aggressive a strategy as you want, even if the tires go into the red. It's not a concern unless they hit the max tire temp, which I'll show you in a second. But as you can see, I've set up a few strategies. Uh, this one, the one-stopper, estimated to take it 129.58. If I do a one-stopper on a soft tire where we run it less aggressive, it's actually estimated to be five seconds quicker than the other one-stopper. And the reason for that is simple. The softs are really, really quick. And since we're running them on light, they basically, the lap time difference. We lose lap time from running, running light, but the de less degradation, because we have less degradation over the course of the stint, we actually gain time because of that, which means that even though we're running these mediums more aggressively, running these softs like this is gonna be quicker. So it's a bit of a weird one, but you can actually turn, in this case, a set of soft tires into a set of hards and still have benefits over, say, running a medium tire. 
But the main reason why I'm saying that you want to run as aggressive a strategy as you can is very, very simple here. As you can see, this soft strategy, soft, medium, soft, or medium, soft, soft, both of these are a good 24 seconds quicker than this strategy. And this estimation is fairly accurate. So do keep that in mind. Now, we could, of course, do a uh, what the game would probably do, which is something like this. They will give you this as a basis. And as you see, it's 16 seconds slower. But you are perfectly free to meddle with these base strategies as much as you want. And as long as the degradation here, this line here represents 30% tire wear, which is where they really start to lose performance. As long as you pitch before you hit this line, you're generally fine. So you can push the tires all the way down here. There's no real negatives of doing so. So keep that in mind. Run as aggressive strategies as you can. And that will generally be a really, really good way of getting, well, maximum performance out of your car. Now, we're going to be running uh, basically both cars here on the same strategy, which is a aggressive uh, soft stint. And the reason I, I want to talk a little bit about why you might want to choose to use your mediums in this case, uh, early or late. And the main reason why you either start on the softs rather than mediums is that if you're starting towards the back of the grid, you can start on a soft tire and pit earlier than what you would on the medium tire. And because you're pitting earlier, you're going to be pitting earlier onto a different tire. And the idea is that, I'll actually show it in, in race, but I'll just explain it quickly. The idea by running a soft tire when you're towards the back of the grid is pit earlier, get onto a new tire. Because that new tire is quicker than everyone else's tires because they're fresh, you can overtake people without overtaking them on track because they'll be pitting later than you. You'll be gaining time on them while you're on these new tires. Once they pit, they'll come out behind you. And as such, you can save yourself a little bit of uh, time and battling on track by pitting early. Conversely, when you are running towards the front of the grid, you might want to start on medium or even hard in order to go longer and get more of a gap to the cars behind so that when you pit, you're not going to be pitting into traffic. That is basically the general idea. But I do have a race strategy guide in the description. You can have a look at that. But for now, we're actually just going to go through the most important thing you can do at the start of a race. And that is actually just turn pace mode, fuel usage, and the RS strategy to deploy. And the reason for this is incredibly simple. It is what the AI does. Every AI starts the race like this. And a lot of the complaints, particularly early on when the game was released, was that the AI are rockets for the first couple of laps. And that is because the AI is pushing everything it has for the first two, three, four, sometimes even five laps. And as a result, if you're not doing the same, they are going to overtake you and you're going to be losing a lot of positions fairly early. So because of that, it's imperative that you do this. And also, as I said, you can use whatever strategy you want. But currently, the strategies that run very, very aggressively are the most efficient ones. Other than that, I just want to make sure that you are, as I said, on the correct strategy. We're actually going to start Norris on the mediums here because I think having the added benefit and speed of the softs for later would benefit him more. And we might try the same here with Piastri, honestly. So that is the wrong strategy, but the idea is there. So you can just do something like this. You can change this in race, so don't worry about it. With that, let's jump into this race and see how we can Here perform. And this is it, the Bahrain Grand Prix. It's lights out. Away we go. So once the races start, I actually like to pause, and that is because I want to correct a few things before we begin. So generally, as you can see, because of the way the confidence work, it gets reset to the base level before qualifying. Uh, this is what we had with Piastri. He didn't lose any from after qualifying. He didn't gain any. But as you can see, currently a medium, it still gives him a very small boost, but the chance of incident is also medium. And the main way to get confidence up is straight up by overtaking, defending, and generally just doing well. Now, you have some overtake aggression options here, high, medium, or low. And we want to put that on low for a very simple reason. It lowers the chance of overtake, yes, but we remove, we min minimize the risk of spins and lockups and risk of corner collisions. And we want to do the same here for the defend approach because that too limits risk. And the main thing that you're going to be struggling with, particularly in the first season, is drivers crashing a lot. So. I say that it's very, very much worth it to click these two just to save yourself a lot of pain from crashes and lockups. And generally, particularly if you have a control reduction um, sponsorship, these can be key 
to fighting those. Now, if you get stuck buying a car, you can always turn this up for a little while, but generally I turn it down to low again as soon as possible. Now, these three things, avoid high-risk curbs, drive in clean air, and don't fight teammate. Basically, this allows your teammate to pass by uh, without a fight, but the driver will slow down. So don't use this when you have other cars nearby or in the middle of a straight for that matter. Avoid high-risk curbs is basically straightforward. You avoid the high-risk curbs. Um, it was very glitchy, but it has been patched. So generally, I don't use these, but you can always use this if you are in trouble. So you have the options there. But yeah, we want to do this immediately for both. It's just the easiest way. And if you want to, you can also toggle on the ERS battle assist. Basically, it gives the AI control over the battery to some degree. They'll use it as they see fit. You can still use deploy neutral top up and harvest, but generally the AI will try to harvest when they have opportunities, use a little bit more of the battery to attack, things like that. In general, you will end up losing a little bit of lap time, but because of the fact that it alleviates, uh, well, you lose a little bit of time over the course of the race, but it alleviates the need to micromanage the ERS somewhat. So that is why I prefer to toggle it on. Now with those things out of the way, we can actually go ahead and get the race started. And depending on how things go, you'll be seeing the confidence go up and down. And as I said, the driver confidence has a huge effect on your chance of incidents. So generally you want to keep this as high as possible. Personal best sector one improves it, things like that. But for the first uh, for the first stint, so to speak, before you pit for the first time, you're probably not going to be seeing too many changes in position because for the most part, there's going to be a lot of DRS trains. Now, a DRS train refers to basically a driver running behind another driver who runs behind another driver within a second of each other, which is kind of what we're seeing here. Because of the fact that DRS uh, means that the car behind will generally go quicker, you'll end up in a situation where one car, when the car in first and second of the train will keep on overtaking each other while the rest just can't get into position to attack. And that is very usual to get stuck in such a position, I'll be honest. And the main way to, to get out of that is just to do a pit stop. So that is also one of the reasons why pitting early can be very, very beneficial. But for now, we're going to talk a little bit about the tire temperature. So as I said, the tire temps aren't a big problem unless you go over a certain degree. In this case, 135 degrees. Each tire has their own temperature. And depending on the tires chosen, um, this temperature will be different from track to track. So mediums with 135 degrees here aren't necessarily mediums with 135 degrees uh, anywhere else. But as I said here, even though the race engineer there did complain, the degradation here, as long as it doesn't go over this white line, doesn't go below the expected it here, and it is actually following it, we are actually perfectly fine. Secondly, fuel here. Generally, at the start of races, I like to push for basically 1.3, uh, 1.6, 1.8 kilograms negative. Because the way that the fuel works is that over time, uh, well, basically, you don't use max amount of fuel. So once we turn this balanced, towards the end of the race, we'll basically end up at around zero. So you'll end up gaining fuel if you run the balance for the whole thing. Uh, for the whole race so you want to push it particularly in the beginning of races uh, for fastest lap when you overtake and it's not actually <coughs> and it's not actually a big concern to do so now secondly there's probably a lot of people that's going to say that running attack is bad for you it's scary you're going to have more crashes and that just isn't the fact you can have more incidents running attack because you're lacking brake cooling that is true but in general, running attack doesn't actually increase the risk of damage or crashing. And, crash well, we might as well just have a quick look at this. Verstappen interrupting me. Just a light incident, nothing major. Uh, but as I was saying here, uh, running attack doesn't actually have an effect on your crash risks for the most part. The settings here like overtake aggression does, so do keep that in mind. And uh, honestly, running attack is going to be the quick strategy available to you. Now keep in mind that we're running with a McLaren. Uh, we're running medium tires, while the rest of the grid is on soft tires, so they have a inherent a tent advantage, and they're going to keep that advantage for the entire stint for the most part. But as I was saying, it is what it is. You'll just have to deal with it. And honestly, I think that is all that you really need to know about race strategy. Uh, the ERS here, 
harvest is basically recharging the battery, top up is recharging the battery, but slowly. And employ is push everything you have to get overtakes done. So I tried to remember something else, but for now, let's just speed along until that first pit stop. And we'll talk a little bit about some consideration that you need to do when you decide to pit. Remember earlier why I said that smoothness is going to be a very important skill for your drivers? It is because, as you can see here, Piastri has been following the line a little bit negatively compared to what we expected. But in general, this should be enough for him to do two more laps, which puts him very close to our initial goals. Now, keep in mind, running 30%, below 30% is advisable. But at the same time, uh, you're kind of safe still. You can push the tires down to 20% before you have a risk of a puncture. Above 20%, you'll never have them. So, while this is not perfect, it's good enough. But as you can see here from Norris, he's actually got a 10% tire advantage on... Uh, on Piastri. And if you consider the fact that basically 70% of the tire is usable, having 10% when you only have 70% available to you is kind of massive. And as you can expect, Norris is getting a lot of extra performance out of the tires because of this. And now we get this even more of that out on the softs. So that is why it's very important to kind of invest into your driver's smoothness. It has a huge effect on the strategies you have available to you for one but it actually has a pretty tangible effect on your driver's speed. Now, in terms of pitting, let's talk a little bit about some considerations that you might have to make. In general, when you want to pit, you have to make, take some consideration into where you're gonna come out. In our case here with Piastri, he's probably gonna come out towards the back. We had about, I think it was 23 seconds average loss of time. So we're gonna be coming out around show, which is unfortunate, but it is the reality of things, unfortunately, for Piastri. With Norris, things get a little bit more interesting here because we're going to be coming out around Sargent. So, ideally, we'd like to push these tires a little bit further so that we can pit, uh, so that we can keep on increasing this gap a little bit, which we actually are. So, as long as you increase the gap to the car that you'll be fighting on the pit exit, you can actually leave your car out. But if this gap gets really, really close, you might want to consider pitting them earlier. For Piastri, we're just going to get him in this lap, and we're going to keep him on aggressive. There's no reason to change. For Norris, we're going to allow him to stay out for, I think, a lap or two more, because we are still extending. Well, we're not actually. We're keeping it around the same. I think we're going to pit Norris, too, here, because Norris has the benefit of lower tire wear, so we can actually pit him before we would really like to. But generally, these are the decisions you'll have to make when you uh, run the team. Of course, running wet tires, things like that, is going to be a little bit more... Uh, difficult to decide, but generally, just as an example, on wet tires, once the the numbers here reach 0 0.80, that's when you want to switch to, well, wets or dries in our case. And Norris actually does pretty well, comes out ahead of Stroll and Albin, so that is really, really good. A lot of clean air, way further up than we <laughs> anticipated, which is also nice. But Piastri did come out in the back here, kind of what expect what we expected. And before Norris gets these tires up to temperature, he is going to be a bit slower. But we also need to keep in mind that Stroll is in a uh, Aston. He has vastly better machinery than us. So honestly, having him pull help pulls ahead here is not a bad idea. But yeah, I think that covers it basically for race strategy. It's basically just pit stops, figuring out what the good moments are. I do have a more in-depth race strategy guide, as I said. So this has been the basics for race strategy and generally as long as you follow these, you should be perfectly fine. At the end of your season, you'll get a few options going for you. In particular, you can actually change a bunch of stuff. So this is where you can switch teams if you really want to, or you can accept the team's new target. In this case, we're just going to accept new target because I want to go over what you can change, in particular to the sponsor obligations. So as you can see here, race hospitality, driver parents, the board has decided that we need these two sponsor requirements. But that doesn't mean that you can't try and limit them. In this case, 15 is the lowest we can go. For driver parents, 15 is as low as we can go. But we can limit it to just one of our drivers if we want, if we want to. But if in our case, we have Bottas and Alonso, both older drivers, actually going maximum driver, uh, well, driver appearances, is necessarily a bad thing. Now, race team events, uh, race day factory events, factory events, and this other one the race weekend driver appearance with lowers the control performance, I'd generally be very wary of using. Honestly, none of these four, and honestly, not even this one either, is worth it. This one can be worth it. And the merchandising here can also be very, very much worth it because it's basically like we pay a preseason cost 
it increase our income per race. And if we maximize this over the course of a season, you can see that we make 10, almost 10 million, 9, 9 million or so. We do pay 80 million upfront. So if we don't, if we have money, doing this is actually a no brainer. But generally in your first season, probably won't be able to do that, but it's perfectly fine to go ahead and, uh, and do so. Now, also at the end of the year, before you start a new season, it'll tell you basically the board expectations, your current balance, the technical changes, and if you, you know, made the good of them, how your research went. And you can go through this and have a look yourself, but generally you can have some pretty decent results doing research. Financially tells you the, you know, the uh, regulation changes here. In this case, we had none, but it'll tell you if say the price board changed or anything like that. It'll also tell you if anything changed in terms of sporting regulations. In this case, we had no changes, but yeah, basically these three are just for potential regulation changes. Now, in terms of picking an engine, uh, generally there's no real wrong options here with the exception of Mercedes, uh, unfortunately. So Ferrari, Renault, Red Bull, and it's pains me to say this, but Mercedes is actually the worst engine this year. All of these have strengths and weaknesses. Basically, none of these are the wrong choice. Mercedes is just slightly worse, but generally, no matter which one of you pick, you'll be fine. So Rebel has the best acceleration, but they also have the highest wear of some components. So it's, uh, again, completely up to you what you choose. I like to choose Rebel. I like to see big numbers go up in terms of acceleration, and they have the highest. And that is basically it. You're on with the new season. And I do want to pick some uh, to make something really, really clear here. So as you can see here, last year we won by a good 300 points. So you'd probably expect our car to be amazing. And you're not correct on that. As you can see, the car is a piece of shit right now. And the reason for that is actually incredibly simple. It is what I talked about in the beginning of the video. Is that when you start a season, you are given a car that has everything in the middle. And of course, if you make a very specialized car that can get more performance out of it by using sliders, of course, you're going to be losing a lot of performance from running everything in the middle. As you can see, even just putting the chassis back together as it used to be, uh, is currently going to boost us into the best team in terms of medium speed. And I think if we go ahead here and say make a suspension or a front wing or even just the underfloor here, that too would go ahead and do a lot of work in terms of getting us back into uh, you know, a top team on the grid. So take this into consideration. Your your car isn't complete until you have made every one of these six parts once, and then you can compare it to the rest of the grid. So honestly, don't worry about that. And I think that is it, honestly, for this guide. I think I've gone through, for the most part, everything that I wanted to do. It's been a bit lengthier than I needed, probably gone through a little bit more in depth than just the basics and some, some stuff, honestly. But if you're new to F1 Manager and this helped you, I would be very appreciative if you left a like on the video, if you subscribed, as that helps me out a ton. But yeah, this probably... This probably was a little bit more than was needed as a basic guide for uh, F1 Manager. But even then, if you could pick it up over Christmas, if you have decided to try it on Game Pass, hope you enjoyed the game, and I hope to see you around next time. Bye-bye.